Now, I want to submit to you that this passage of scripture that Roz read out to us, I think it's one of the most challenging scriptures in all the Bible. Not because it's unclear, <laughs> but because it is so clear. It certainly explains, I think, a lot of things about what is happening on out there in the world and why some people, they just cannot see the goodness of the gospel, that they're blind to it. You can deal with this issue today in two ways. I guess one way is that you can sit as judge and jury over God and determine to force our ways and our thoughts upon him. The second way is that we be humble and we admit that we are not omniscient. That means that we do not know everything that there is to know. And recognising that you don't know everything enables us to, I think, settle down and give a passage like this one a fair hearing. Today's passage comes straight off the back of Paul's comment about Jacob and Esau. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And Paul notes that this has been determined before the twins were born. So often you hear today uh, in the news a fight for so-and-so's rights. Some person or some group's rights. And little do they realise that there's really no absolute arbiter that decides what is a human right. For example, who decides if homosexual marriage is a human right. The West claims that it is a human right, but the majority of other nations deny that it is a human right. And we find this all the time. People, you know, pluck these rights out of thin air. I mean, who gets to say that anything is a human right? Now, of course, we would say that God is the one who actually confers rights, Although, in reality, God is more interested in people being responsible to others in treating them rightfully. I think that's more accurate about what God wants. But the West, by and large, does not believe in God, and that is why they call Australia, like many other Western nations, secular nations. So who gives these rights? Well, they're given by whoever is the dominant force at the time. Who's got the upper hand? You see, it's all relative because rights are conferred by the whim of the ideology that is current at the time. And if they do get conferred and as soon as society changes, those rights can also get changed. Who considers, however, that God has rights? Do we ever give any consideration to God having certain rights. So how about we set up another agency? Now we're good at setting up agencies, aren't we? Let's set up the Court of Divine Rights. How about that? How far do you think that would go to get off the ground in the West? Not very far, I would imagine. But today's passage, however, is precisely on this kind of a point. It expresses the truth that God has rights and his rights extend over every person and animal on planet Earth. This particular passage expresses God's right to have mercy or compassion on whoever he pleases. His right. And the Apostle Paul is adamant that this is God's right and there's no injustice in this. That's surprising, isn't it? But we don't think that way. But Paul is adamant there's no injustice with God having the right to show mercy or compassion on whomever he pleases. So this passage today continues the perplexing dilemma that we saw in chapter, the beginning of chapter 9. There Paul says, For I could wish that I myself were a curse separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Israel's not saved. They have not gone to their Messiah. And Paul shares grief here 
with us, that he would rather be cut off so that they might come to know God and have salvation. And then in verse 6 he says, It's not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. So he emphasises the fact here that ethnicity, the ethnicity of Israel, Jewishness, he's saying is irrelevant when it comes to divine choice of mercy and compassion. The existence of the law, we know, came into being with Moses. John 1.17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth was realised through Jesus Christ. Remember how Moses smashed the two tablets of the law? After Israel had gone back to idolatry, they made the golden calf and was worshipping it. Before he goes back up on the mountain, God says that he's going to do something for Moses. He's going to show him something. And here in Exodus 33, he says, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. And even toward Israel, they stand by God's sovereign choice, not of their doing. Israel became the means through which God revealed himself to the world. They were not to go taking airs and graces upon themselves because they were chosen for a mission and a responsibility. You know, there are two great revelations in history, God's history. And it displays God's great sovereignty. The first one is this. Israel being delivered from the Egyptians through the Red Sea. That was the first great revelation of God. So during which God raised up Pharaoh, he hardens Pharaoh so that Pharaoh would resist letting Israel go free from their slavery. Ten massive plagues decimate Egypt. God drowns the Egyptians in the Red Sea while they tried to pursue Israel. And he saves his people through dry ground as they pass through the Red Sea. God had revealed his great power and his great name throughout all the earth during that event. So he hardens Pharaoh to bring in his power and reveal himself to the world. Rahab, the harlot, knew this well, and she and that became a catalyst for her repentance. Here as Israel get ready to attack Jericho, this is what she says to the spies. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. Notice what she says here. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. So put this together here. God hardened Pharaoh, making him stubborn so that he would resist allowing Israel to go. God pours out his power and strength in rescuing Israel and destroying Egypt and he has made himself known throughout all the earth and here's a woman from Jericho who sees it and believes. Now this is a hard teaching, isn't it? But you know, the same thing happened in the New Testament. So let's go to our second point. The church, the true Israel, is delivered from her sin at Calvary. So Judas, Judas is the man who betrayed Jesus. And in that betrayal, he set in motion his crucifixion, death and resurrection. On the day of Pentecost, the Apostle Peter preached a sermon and he included this section here. He says, this man, this man Jesus, delivered over, now get this, by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. 
you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. The predetermined plan of God it was no accident that Jesus was crucified. It was the predetermined plan of God. Jesus himself said this, the son of man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And that is Judas. It is the predetermined sovereign plan of God. So the question, why has not the majority of Israel accepted the Messiah Jesus? Because God willed it. As with Pharaoh, they were hardened and are now vessels on whom God's wrath rests. Now that may seem incompatible with their understanding of the promises to Israel, but as we had seen in the message last week, that they were, was, were not seeing the forest for the trees. It was not about being an ethnic people. We saw that in that passage there last week, but about being the people of the promise. The promise is the true Israel. So God is sovereign, we see here, as Paul says, over the mercy he shows and Israel in doing the works of the law in all their rituals, in all what the law says that they had to do in the temple offerings and services and all of that, in doing that, even their ethnicity will not save them. God has the right, Paul is saying here, to show mercy on some Israelites and on some Gentiles for salvation. He has the right to harden even the majority of Israel and Gentiles too, if he likes, and subject them to his wrath. Paul gives an illustration then. So we find God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but in his stubbornness, who's responsible? God? No. Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the man who bears the responsibility of his choices. Now, in the sovereignty of God, Judas caused God's predetermined plan to get underway, but Judas did the evil. Judas did the betraying. So how can that be? How can there be no injustice in that? I mean, if these people are made that way, by God's sovereign design, how can he fault these people? This is no doubt a real question raised and the Apostle Paul anticipates this and answers it. <coughs> he doesn't seek to give it an intellectual answer, but he really gives an answer that a mum or dad would give. How dare you talk back like that, young man? <laughs> you know how a mum and dad would speak? How dare you talk back to me like that, young man? Now, Paul is basically saying here, how dare you, you minuscule speck, you pathetic grain of sand in the desert, how dare you judge God? And the point is that God has the right to create who or what he likes. End of story. He made you a person, not a fly, nor a mosquito, nor an ant. He made you who you are. Let me ask you, what do you do with mosquitoes? You squash them, don't you? I don't hear anyone complaining about the death of mosquitoes. And we don't, you know, we don't care if mosquitoes uh, live or die, do we? We don't care about them. In fact, we wouldn't be uh, any more happier if they were you know, fully eradicated from the earth. My point here is that if anyone wants to sit in judgment of God, God who is over us, and accuse him of being capricious or fickle, I mean, what does that say about us who also are over the mosquito and are capricious and fickle in our treatment of mosquitoes? The point the apostle makes here is that God, being the potter, can mould the clay into whatever he desires to make it into. So to Judah and Jerusalem, he says in Isaiah 29, you turn things around 
Shall the potter be considered as equal with the clay? That what is made would say to its maker, He did not make me. Or what is formed say to him who formed it, He has no understanding. Or in chapter 45, Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker, an earthenware vessel among the vessels of earth. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the thing you are making say, he has no hands. <coughs> so the point is that God creates what he likes. He might create a man a certain way so that he is a common person who gives no regard to the Lord, does not believe in him, is not interested in him. Yet he creates another person who responds to him and that person becomes a person of noble use who turns to the Lord. God creates what he likes. He uses these vessels as he likes. <coughs> he creates us, therefore he owns us, doesn't he? And therefore we are not our own. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to God. People have thought that at certain times in human history that it probably wouldn't be a good thing to bring a child into the world. People have thought that, haven't they? You know, the world is such, such a, a terrible place at times, it's not a good idea to bring a child into the world. And they fear that the world would uh, really be to the child's detriment. Now reflect on this for a moment as we uh, look at what Paul says here in verse 22. He writes that God was patient in not ending the world. This is the essence of what he's saying. Because of sin. Because he's waiting for future generations to be born. And out of these future generations, children would be born, both Jews and Gentiles, and they would grow up and be part of God's family. You see, God has withheld his wrath. He's withheld his judgment on the world so that you can be born and that you can know him as Lord and Saviour. He writes here that God was patient. He didn't want to end the world because there were people who would come to know him. His plan is for you before the world began. That's awesome, isn't it? That in itself, hard to conceive, but there you go. That's the truth. So the NIV puts it this way. What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? <coughs> so what if this was the case? Would you be impressed? Would you be grateful? Would you be happy? Would you be thrilled that the patience of God in that patience, you were born and you were destined to know his glory. Destined to know his glory. That God had you sealed before the foundation of the world. See, the world continues because God has predestined into the world the church. Some from Israel, some from the Gentiles. To know his mercy and to know his glory. Yet, you know, we've got a world out there of unbelievers. And let's think about it. They're going their merry way, aren't they? And they interpret this patience of God or that nothing's happening to them as either God doesn't exist or that God does not care. Little do they know that wrath is coming. And they're in the crosshairs. That is sad, but that is the case. Let's look at Romans 2 verse 4. Paul writes there, Do you think lightly of the rich of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Then the Apostle Peter, likewise, he says, The Lord is not slow about his promises, some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Every person, let's make this clear, has the opportunity to respond to God. 
Their fate is not sealed. They can respond to God. And in the patience of God, the vessels of mercy will hear and believe. Proverbs 16. The Lord has made everything for his own purpose, even the wicked for the day of disaster. When it comes to working out why God allows the wicked to continue even to flourish, and we see that too, don't we? We need to keep in mind the fact that God is revealing to us the riches of his glory as we see a world that is so bent on opposing him. They're so bent on opposing him, we see a contrast then. So those who are, are persecuting the church at Philippian, Philippi, rather, Paul says, in no way be alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them but of salvation for you, and that too from God. That's a sign there of your salvation, that they oppose you because they oppose God, you see. 2 Corinthians 2, For we are the fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one an aroma from death to death, to the other an aroma of life to life. Now Paul is saying, we all carry, metaphorically, an odour or smell. Maybe some of us carry a physical smell, but okay. He's talking metaphorically here, isn't he? Christian to Christian, Paul says, we bear the beautiful aroma of Christ. And that aroma speaks of abundant life, quality and quantity. Yet, to the world, however, metaphorically, we give the smell of death, the aroma of their death. You know, I remember my father working in a crematorium once. He was building an extension uh, on the crematorium. He would come home and he would come home smelling rank, a deadish smell. I don't know if you've ever been near a crematorium for, for too long, but the, 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 the ash was on his clothes and the, the, the stench of that, honestly, it's, it really did smell of death. It was, it was absolutely terrible. I mean, you're getting the picture, aren't you? That aroma indicated and reminded you of a vivid way of death. So when we present Christ to the world in who we are, in you know, what we say and what we do, they're coming face to face, you see, with their own destiny, which is death, judgment. God's restraint in judgment makes room for the future salvation of the called Jews and Gentiles and also shows us, his people, the destruction which we will avoid. We're not going down that path. What we see is the glory that is coming for us. So our final point today, we return to the beginning comments there that Paul makes concerning the fact that the Lord will have compassion and mercy on whom he chooses. Pharaoh was hardened for God's own purposes in the world. He turns now and says that God has the same judicious right to do the same with Israel. And these passages he quotes from are from Hosea and from Isaiah. Some of you are familiar with the book of Hosea. There Hosea is to take to himself a wife of harlotry, of prostitution. Now as a prophet of God, Hosea is to live out his relationship with his wife, this prostitute, as a physical demonstration of God's relationship with Israel. Israel had become a harlot, a prostitute as she had gone after other gods, has committed adultery against her husband, God. Now in this, God casts Israel off, divorces her, judges her. The Assyrians conquer the northern kingdom of Israel, decimated them, repopulates the land with Gentiles, deports Jews to Assyria and to Egypt. 
But then he decides to have compassion and mercy on some. The majority are finished. But there are a few that God decides to spare and to show mercy to. These are called the remnant, the remnant of Israel. They are part of the true Israel of God. The rest of Israel were hardened and judged. So he says in verse 25, as indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, these are the ones who were judged and divorced, I will call my people and her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, then they will, shall be called sons of the living God. God brought back the remnant to himself. But of the prophet Isaiah, we find here says the same thing. In verse 27, though the number of the sons of Israel be as sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. So God, through the prophet Isaiah, slams dunk the southern kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem for all the empty and religious, you know, the real empty religious rituals and routines that they go through because their hearts were far from the Lord. They did not pursue him by faith. Here in Isaiah 29, and this is because they could not perceive or understand the things of God, then the Lord said, because this people draw near with their words and honour me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me. And their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rout. Now, believing that doing the works of the law expressed in all the rituals was the answer, they just never learned to honour the Lord with their heart and with their ethics. They thought that by multiplying their sacrifices and rituals that they would have God defeat their enemies. In one sense, they were manipulating God. They were trying to manipulate him to defeat their enemies by multiplying all the rituals and the sacrifices. Here we see in Isaiah 1 verse 7, God says, your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate, as overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion is left like a booth, like an old shack in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like this little tin shed that's been there for 120 years, you know, and it's all falling apart. Like a besieged city, he says. This is what your nation now looks like. If the Lord of hosts had not left us survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. That is, they would have shared the same fate as Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord destroyed the place and there was no one left, period. Isaiah now addresses Judah and Jerusalem, not as the people of God, but as the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings, incense, is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity. That is sin and the solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, that is in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Paul makes the point here from Isaiah that pursuing the works of the law 
is not the same as pursuing God from the heart and through faith, you see. In short, in this last section, he maintains that only the remnant will be saved. It is only the remnant that pursued God through their love of him and through faith. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. Now, a lot of scripture here, but there's one really that helped me, I guess, shape my thoughts on the truth that true Israel is the church comprised of Jew and Gentile. And that is from Ephesians 2. But now in Christ Jesus, <coughs> you who are formerly were far off, that's the Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups, Jew and Gentile, into one. Broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two, Jew and Gentile, into one new man, thus establishing peace. And he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. I think there's far too little attention given to this verse when it comes to the position of Israel, the nation, that he might make the two <clears throat> into one new man. This is the true Israel that Paul is again talking about here, promised by God from the time of Abraham, the remnant, which is the church. <coughs> and the apostle Peter, he says, for you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And Peter here is talking to the Gentile churches. So in summary, Paul takes for granted that God's sovereignty of the world gives no one a right to complain about what he does with it, on whom he shows mercy to. And what makes Jewish people of Paul's day feel secure that their Jewishness will save them? What is it? Well, Paul says that their history shows that God only saved a remnant. And therefore, that they have really no basis for rejecting the Messiah and relying on their Jewishness. You see, that's the real problem. They're relying on their Jewishness instead of relying on the Messiah. Only those who believe in Jesus, he says, will be numbered as God's people. They, he says, are the true Israel of God. And what a great blessing it is that God has done this that he has opened up his wonderful mercy to us who are Gentile people, predominantly. <laughs> I know we have one Jewish lady here, but we are predominantly Gentile people. And what a great blessing it is that God has brought his mercy to us as well.